friends. This is Reflections, a program sponsored by Paducah Cooperative Ministry, where together we do God's work with human hands. I'm Karen Winkle, pastor at United Church of Paducah. And uh, with me is Gregory Waldrop, the co-host today, who uh, pastors at Fountain Avenue United Methodist Church. Good to see you. Glad to be right here uh -huh. once again. Mm -hmm. Glad you all are here with us as well. As always, every month we have a Bible study and we have a great panel of pastors who will help us study the resurrection text out of John's Gospel. We are very glad to have with us Libby Wade, who is the uh, rector, vicar, which what's rector, the, rector yeah. at uh, Grace Episcopal Church. Welcome Libby. We Thank have you. also Paul Mulliken, who is at Arcadia United Methodist Church. And we have Don Watkins, who is the pastor at Grace no, New um, Geneva. Kind of New Geneva. Geneva. I'm sorry. Geneva I'm sorry. Church. New Geneva Community Church. First right. Reform uh, Presbyterian. Super. Very good. Welcome to all of you. And uh, we'll go in reverse order and give Don a chance to tell us about yourself. I know you're new uh, lately to the area and the church. Sure. Well, I actually grew up here. I uh, have a lot of relatives here, including my 87-year-old uh, mother and uh, other uh, family members. And I have returned here after... Uh, I've been going for 34 uh, years, I think, and to start a uh, new church, uh, New Geneva, and uh, had an interesting, interesting core group here. And in fact, some of them are friends of yours, uh, Gregory, and uh, so you know the quality of people uh, that That's I'm good. working with I and do. have a great hope that we can uh, reach out into Paducah and reach out to the needs that are there and uh, join uh, with other churches that are doing the same thing and try to have a, uh, you know, have an impact on Paducah for for our Lord Jesus Christ. Great. And you yeah. meet in the um, activity building at? In, at uh, Margaret Hank, uh, Cumberland Presbyterian. Right. Right, right there on yeah. Park Avenue. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Paul. Well, I'm from uh, Memphis, Tennessee. I was born and raised there and have spent the bulk of my life and ministry in Tennessee mm -hmm. and have just moved <coughs> to Paducah back in June. Uh, and are enjoying my time at Arcadia United Methodist Church. I have three grown children and are glad to be here in this fine town. Great. Well, I'm originally from Alabama. I've lived all over the southeast, plus a short sh sojourn in North Dakota a long time ago. Wow. And um, have been at Grace Church for two years now, which makes me the oldest of the three of us here, which is a new position for me to be hey, in. Really? Um, and um, Grace Church has some exciting things going on these days. I'd love to invite the community to come join with us in, in a Taze contemplative communion service on Sunday evenings at five o'clock. And um, our young adult group has just recently really gotten moving and going and are sponsoring a movie night once a month on Monday nights, but also meeting every Wednesday at Jeremiah's for conversation and dialogue around theological themes that they decide on and uh, some food and, and drink along the way as well. So um, that's open to anyone in their 20s and 30s and I'm getting to come as a visitor this week and, and talk with the group and I'm really interested in seeing what they're, what they're doing and discussing. And we just learned um, yesterday, in fact, that the new presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Catherine Jeffert Shorey, will be at Grace Church in May of 2008. So we've got a year to, to plan that and really work on it. And that's very exciting for us. Great. We're glad you all are here. Very glad. And uh, let's move right into the scriptures. The, again, the resurrection text mm -hmm, from John's mm -hmm. Gospel, the 20th chapter. I will read, and this is from the uh, New Revised Standard Version of uh, the Bible. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, 
and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that this was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he said these things to her. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Powerful word. What strikes us about this good word? Well, I think one of the things that gets me here is so much. It talks about seeing. Every time you turn around, somebody's seeing this, seeing that. And it finally comes to talk about the beloved disciples saw Mm -hmm. and believed. But not everybody who saw the same thing Mm -hmm. came to that conclusion shows us to you know the evidence of the resurrection is a little bit more than the evidence of physical sight that we have there's something else going on in our hearts it's a real story of hope and promise for us for those of us who have never seen these things that they saw and yet you know the promise that comes later in the chapter mm-hmm. is that that the truth is still for us the resurrection hope that we have you know the beloved disciple who sees and believes and what he's seeing is not the resurrected Jesus. He's seeing the empty tomb at that place. So there's a, a sense in which he's still resting on the his his faith that he's acquired he that? Yeah, through his life with Jesus. Yeah. yeah, this whole notion of faith and sight is bound up together a lot of places, isn't it, all the way through. Mm-hmm. And, uh, this new way of seeing almost, this this faith that God brings uh, is often by not only the biblical writers but mm-hmm. some of the great uh, fathers and mothers of the church they mm-hmm. talk about it as mm-hmm. faith is sight and Jesus let those who have eyes to see mm-hmm. over and over sure. mm-hmm. at the same time there were evidences here you think about you know John looks at this and there is a hundred pounds of, of herbs and spices laying on top of a what were had been around a body and they're laying there. The body's missing. Mm-hmm. If the body had been removed, they wouldn't have unwrapped him and taken, you know, this would have been, uh, or if they had moved the body, there'd have been spices all over the tomb. But they're laying there in a pile, undisturbed, minus the body. And so, of course, he's an eyewitness, and now we're asked to believe his testimony, along with all the other eyewitnesses, which I think the main thing that strikes me is this is the beginning of a series of people, Mary Magdalene, you know, Peter, the other women, the 11 at the upper room, and then uh, over 500 that Paul wrote about in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. He said most of them still were alive, like 30 years later, 25, 30 years later. So we have all these eyewitnesses, and some of them would say that, you know, if we can't believe in the resurrection, we have no reason to believe any history at all. This is one of the most well-attested uh, historical events uh, on record to say nothing of having over 5,000 you know, Greek manuscripts that some which go back within, you know, certainly in the early uh, part of the second century compared to other uh, events of antiquity, which oftentimes the earliest manuscripts, say for example, uh, Caesar or uh, other Greek, uh, maybe Homer, maybe a thousand years before we have the first extant documents. And we have just a few years 
with thousands of documents to prove it. I think it just begins to, to me to stand out just how uh, this is out there. It wasn't done in the corner. A lot of eyewitness testimony recorded that we can have confidence in. I am intrigued by uh, by that uh, the, the whole mm -hmm. uh, the whole part of it, um, particularly this notion of mm -hmm. an empty tomb. Mm -hmm. You know, we we sort of um, what we sort of buy into the Greek notion in our popular culture mm -hmm. about spirit being separated from flesh and somehow mm -hmm. the body sort of dissolves into nothing and it's not as important as the mm -hmm. spirit. But here mm -hmm. there is a different emphasis. The tomb is empty. The body is no more. Whatever resurrection mm -hmm. life is, its raw materials mm -hmm. are the physicality of Jesus' life. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reminders to me at least of how much the Judeo-Christian tradition values the material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We so often uh, I I emphasize the spiritual without lifting up the equally as valuable mm -hmm. physical uh, that, uh, that, that at least in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. And I think this mm -hmm. resurrection of the body is one of those places that that happens. Mm -hmm. Does that affect your uh, ministry to the poor? It, it affects, it's why we feed the hungry. You better yeah. believe it. It's why we take, why Jesus mm -hmm. says uh, visiting the sick and yeah. shelter for the homeless and yeah. all that sort of thing is mm -hmm. important. It's because it's this marriage of physical and spiritual yeah. that Jesus models and that he offers to us, mm -hmm. not one mm -hmm. highlighted or elevated over the other. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, some of you have some, may have some thoughts on this, just that whole Greek idea of the primacy or superiority of the spirit over the physical, that's uh, certainly the worldview of the Greco-Roman world, right. certainly fueled a lot of the, the Gnostic writings that came along in right. following centuries, and I think it's here today with us in our current culture, isn't it? It is, it is. I think that, that heresy is still live and fresh. Yeah. When we come to this, though, I think to look really at Mary you know, focus on the beloved disciple, and I think that's important there. Mm -hmm. But Mary came to believe as well, mm -hmm. and yeah. the change that happened to Mary mm -hmm. is fulfilling a promise that Jesus had given to the disciples, which in John's gospel, the disciples are not just the 11 or 12, it's all of the followers that gather together. Mm -hmm. And it was there that he said, you will mourn, <sighs> you will weep, but there will joy come to you, back in the 16th chapter. And Mary mm -hmm. begins weeping, crying, mm -hmm. And yet, finally, when she has that encounter with Christ, and it's amazing, she, she sees the empty tomb like the beloved disciples, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, she doesn't understand. She thinks they've taken him. Mm -hmm. And then you have her also having the witness of these two angels, these men, messengers of God that are there, and it still doesn't click. She even sees Jesus, and it still doesn't click for whatever reason. But finally, when Jesus calls her name. Right. She hears his voice. Yeah. And, and what she responds is, is more than just a general term of teacher. It's my teacher. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's my God. And uh, well, Thomas will later have that confession. But yeah. for her, uh, it's when she hears, she comes to faith. Mm -hmm. Beloved disciples, mm -hmm. it, it, he just sees an empty tomb and comes to faith. Later mm -hmm. we find Thomas who you know, has to, well, the other disciples have to see him before they will believe. They don't even believe Mary's mm -hmm. testimony. Uh, Thomas even says, well, I want to touch him. And what's amazing mm -hmm. is in the scriptures, there seems to be no qualification of, oh, this person has a better faith than the other. Mm -hmm. What's important is they all come to faith. And we all come to faith in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some of us, it comes easy as it did for the beloved disciple because they have such a relationship there, it's just natural to believe. Mm -hmm. There's others of us that struggle with the evidence that we see, that no matter how many folks tell me the testimony, mm -hmm. I'm still gonna struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And at least Thomas is honest enough to admit that. But Mary, mm -hmm. you have the fulfillment of that promise mm -hmm. of coming to have someone that now 
she believes because she has that personal relationship. Mm -hmm. It's more than just somebody saying, hey, you. It's calling by name. Mm -hmm. The good shepherd is the one that mm -hmm. knows the name of the sheep, and the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice. Mm -hmm. Mary does that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Such a beautiful way of telling the story because it recalls mm -hmm. that passage mm -hmm. so clearly. The when the gardener speaks to Mary, because she perceives as the gardener speaks to her and she all of a sudden knows the voice, mm -hmm. recognizes him and it, it just brings back that whole story of the calling, the sheep, shepherd knowing his sheep right. and the sheep knowing Their them. Their sense of intimacy yeah. and love. Yeah. yeah. Well, in, in, in the Easter story, however it's told, people have a hard time understanding immediately who it is that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. and. Oh, yeah. You know, I love the the road to Emmaus and that that story. But what what does this say to us? That I mean, because you're talking about recognition, but but also the lack of recognition. Um, what does that say to us as the um, you know as we seek to live out our faith? Um, that that there are encounters that that we have that we don't know how, how to make meaning of them sometimes. You know, if um, uh, the, one of the things that I th that I feel strongly um, about is um, uh, helping provide a place for people to talk about experiences that they're having because so often we're like Mary in that in between. You know, it's the gardener and those experiences in our lives that really are glimpses of of Christ can can be ones that we miss that if we don't have support sometimes in mm -hmm. in. Um, in, right. in recognizing the voice that's speaking mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. in an experience. I, I can remember uh, um, at a service once, and uh, I'd sort of set through what was at the time a fairly mysterious kind of a sermon. I, it, mm -hmm. didn't, it didn't quite connect in all the places, and I, I sort of dismissed it until the final benediction. The final benediction, the pastor said something that clicked and it made me go back to the sermon mm -hmm. and just realize what he was, in fact, it made me go back and really search this, what I recalled of the sermon. And I began to see its vitality and it, took, it was in retrospect. And I think in some ways, that's what's happening here as well. Don't mm -hmm. you know that those disciples, part of what happened with the crucifixion, with the d demise of Jesus is they said, well, maybe they said, who knows? I'm glad at least that some of those things Jesus said are, you know, with his death, they probably mean God wasn't in them. But the mm -hmm. resurrection says, oh no, you've got to re-look at all of these teachings mm -hmm. yeah. that the master teacher, the rabbi, offers. And now it sort of vindicates and validates all of these puzzling mm -hmm. teachings about the first being last and the greatest being the servant and all those other things that Jesus fills his, his ministry with. I mean, I mm -hmm. think this notion which she sees him and says Rabboni, Rabboni, however it gets translated, mm -hmm. is this interesting uh, hearkening immediately back to his teachings and saying, hey, look again at those. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Can we take it a little further uh, and think in terms of even like on the road to Emmaus and Jesus opened the scriptures and opened their hearts of not just uh, those more immediate uh, teachings, but the whole Bible. Yeah. And everything that was going on from Genesis to through Malachi in the Old Testament, pointing to the coming Messiah that nobody caught the right way. All opens up, it all falls yeah. open. Yeah. It helps to, when you're reading John 20, to look back at all of John and finally going, ah, that's what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, even mm -hmm. the question, the gar Jesus, the gardener asked mm -hmm. Mary, uh, first, why are you weeping, as the angels have asked, but then he asked, whom are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And you go back and at the very first chapter, the very first mm -hmm. statement that Jesus makes is to those followers of John, what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of come to full gamut. Uh, this isn't the first time Jesus asked this question, whom are you looking for? He, he asked it earlier uh, to the Pharisees and the others. It, and when he asked them, they didn't know what to say. But it's almost like our, our quest as human beings is, um, has changed now. Mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning it was what you're looking for, but it changes to whom. Uh, 
-hmm. and what we are needing in our life to find meaning, yeah. to find purpose mm -hmm. is not a what. It's not something, it's someone. Mm -hmm. This one who offers mm -hmm. eternal life mm -hmm. to us. Um, mm -hmm. Earlier somebody had said something about sharing, how important it is to share this with community. Mm -hmm. I think that has something to do when Mary begins to cling to Jesus. And he's not, don't hold on to me. You go and see somebody else about this. How often we have our own spiritual experiences or moments and we lose that if we just hold it to ourselves or if we think that's all there is about our faith, mm -hmm. this experience that happened in the past. We don't need to hold on to those experiences. We need to take those experiences to the community, mm -hmm. right. to the other disciples, to mm -hmm. share with them, discuss about it. They may not accept us yet, but at least we can open up the announcement and maybe eventually they will come to believe as well, which some did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When Jesus is asking, asking Mary to, in, when she, he says, do not, don't hold on to me. Mm -hmm. Maybe asking her to be open to a new, new experience, beginning. a new yeah. beginning, yeah. Um, a new beginning for the community and as she goes to proclaim to the rest of the disciples. He certainly doesn't uh, forbid touch. You mm -hmm. see that with right. the, later on with Thomas. The very next right. story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but certainly, you know, it's not going to be this, the way it was before. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It's new wine skins now. New wine. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's experience. almost that whole uh, notion of, uh, it, it almost mirrors that notion uh, mm -hmm. where Jesus says in Philippians, mm -hmm. you know, uh, are, uh, said about Jesus that he didn't count divinity something to be grasped yeah. mm -hmm. to be held on to but rather mm -hmm. something to be mm -hmm. uh, uh, laid aside mm -hmm. for the for the good of the mm -hmm. whole and the, mm -hmm. the whole way and so he's asking her to also not grasp not mm -hmm. hoard not hold on to yeah. it very very mm -hmm. interesting how it connects yeah. I think the questions to Mary from the angel and from Jesus why why are you weeping and then who are you looking? Who are you looking for? Um, they're just so poignant and mm -hmm. so um, comforting in the first case. I mean, yeah. if we're sitting weeping, mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm scared or afraid or lonely mm -hmm. or sad, I think what I most want is someone to say, "What's wrong? Mm -hmm. you know, why are you weeping?" Mm -hmm. To allow me to begin to tell my story and to make to make meaning of that in relation to to others. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then the next one then takes it a step further and, and says, you know, what, who are you looking for? You know, what, how, how are you going to make meaning of this situation? You know, what it is that, what is it that will um, fulfill? Yeah, straightforward, mm -hmm. simple, but mm -hmm. as you say, very mm -hmm. poignant. Very and without poignant. saying, here I am. Yeah, it's not mm -hmm. an, an arrogant, you know, here I am, don't you yeah. see me, don't Pay you understand who I am, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And it's the same question, same series of questions he's asked before um, in helping others claim their belief and make meaning of them. The question, um, who do men say that I am, and then mm -hmm. who do you say that I am, to Peter. Mm -hmm. um, they're powerful. Yeah. This is a very important narrative, I think. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other narratives out in our culture. Uh, Dan Brown just wrote a book that showed zillions, uh, Da Vinci Code, Then we have the movie that contradicts just about everything here, where uh, mm -hmm. Jesus is married to Mary Magdalene. Uh, you know, I don't know why she didn't say, oh, my husband, instead of my master or my teacher. Uh, you know, with, with a, uh, and of course, the, looking at uh, da, da Vinci, and his painting of the uh, Last Supper and, and saying that the feminine looking person there is, uh, is actually uh, Mary Magdalene rather than John who's very youthful and often portrayed in a, in a very f feministic uh, light because he is once again not, he's beardless and, and quite young compared to the other disciples. But I think this is straightforward narrative it's kind of debunks just about every lie and uh, heresy portrayed in the Da Vinci Code which many in the church don't know how uh, unbiblical uh, those kind of teachings are that yeah. come really out of uh, Gnosticism. Right, mm -hmm. right. And, and I think you brought a book to, to share with our viewers. I, I, I saw it on your, sure. on your lap. Um, and, and clearly this is something that's important to you to, to address the um, yeah. misunderstandings that sure. come out of Sure, there are actually a lot of books out there uh, mm -hmm. that 
uh, trying to straighten out uh, the Da Vinci uh, Code teachings, and they range from the whole gamut of liberal to conservative uh, scholars in, in the church. Uh, this one's called The Da Vinci Myth versus the Gospel Truth by uh, D. James Kennedy, who happens to be my uh, former pastor. I was actually becoming Christian in uh, Fort Lauderdale through the ministry of Coral Ridge uh, Presbyterian about 30, uh, 33 years ago. And uh, so this is one of many. I can recommend several, but this is one that I found quite helpful that takes on a lot of the uh, distortions uh, about that subject. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other mm -hmm. books that you have found inspirational these days? Well, the one that this chapter mm -hmm. reminded me of when I began to realize that this offers hope to those who are crying in a world that seems to be falling apart. It's a book that was introduced to me a couple of years ago uh, because it was called Holding On to Hope, A Pathway Through Suffering to the Heart of God by uh, Nancy Guthrie. Um, the reason I came to this is I had a family who had lost a, a, a high school child in a, in, a, in a car accident and everybody had given them all kind of books and reading material and the husband and wife would start to read one and set it aside or they would share one. And this is the one they not only shared with each other but they shared with other members of their family and I thought, well, if this is something that really touches their life, I need to hear that. Mm -hmm. And so I went and ordered it off to the internet and got it. And it profoundly touched my life because it's a, it reflects on the story of Job. And it talks about people whose world are falling apart. Mm. And how do you hold on to hope in the midst of this? And that's what Mary found. Mm -hmm. and, and her world had fallen apart. The disciples' mm -hmm. world had fallen apart. But Christ came to give them hope in the midst of their sadness to bring joy in the midst of their sorrow. Mm -hmm. and, and it is a book that, that touches me, not only if you've lost a loved one, but any kind of loss mm -hmm. that you've had in your life. Mm -hmm. I brought with me a book that I was recently given. It's by Marcus Borg, and it's just simply called Jesus. Um, uncovering the life, teachings, and relevance of a religious revolutionary. And I sometimes go, go to Borg when I want to have my own understanding stretched a little bit. Um, and I did that with this particular passage. And he, he speaks of these resurrection appearances and gospel stories as parables and not necessarily historical um, narrative, but parables that have great truth and, and reality to them. And, and that stretches my understanding a bit of, of these stories, but um, I've enjoyed reading portions of this book and looking forward to, to reading the rest of it. Okay, um, well, thank you. We're all out of time oh, and know. we could That's talk another, another half an yeah, hour. Really. Um, but thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here and sharing uh, as you have. Thank you, those of you who've been with us this half hour. Do join us uh, with Paducah Cooperative Ministry in doing God's work with human hands. Shalom. Shalom. <laughs>